questions that you get. Mm. Anyway, let's uh, let's pause there because I'm delighted to say it's time for the papers. Joining us this morning is Sam Fowles, a barrister at Cornerstone and director of the Institute for Constitutional and Democratic Research. A very good morning to you. Good morning. How marvellous being a barrister. I've always fancied that. Well, it's nice, you know. It's one of the very few professions that you get to get to dress up, and, uh, and everyone, uh, we, 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 you know, dress up in 18th century costume, and then everyone, everyone praises us uh, yes. for it. So that's lovely, and, and very theatrical. Well, so I mean, I've seen some advocates that are very theatrical. Um, uh, maybe that, maybe some of the best advocates are actually very, very chill and calm, and uh, just terrify you. Mm. And just in terms of the way you put your case, you obviously think about that a great deal in terms of the way that you present your case the, the thought process yeah absolutely i mean 99 percent of presentation of a, of a case happens in the in the weeks leading up to it and uh, my my people miss just told me that the, the the best thing you can do isn't write a great speech or um you know come up with a brilliant witticism it's just knowing the evidence really really well and knowing to you go go through tens of thousands of pages and knowing exactly where to find that that mm. crucial point and that's that's a really difficult skill it's this one I, I think I'm, I'm probably still working on but uh, I'm, I hugely admire those that have, uh, have nailed it well, I think this is a skill for if you're teaching anyone to present anything this is the this is the main skill if you know your subject inside out you don't need to make notes you don't need to actually write a speech because you will speak it from the heart and all you need are some prompts to keep you on track if someone asks you a question well I imagine you you've uh, gleaned all the papers and you you know everything now from the space papers <laughs> shall, shall, shall we start with the, t the telegraph sure. uh, this this is um, I read this this morning I couldn't quite believe what I was reading the headline is front page this rapists wrongly labeled as women by police well I, I couldn't believe what I was reading either but I, I suspect possibly for a, a, a different reason uh, from from you um, this is just just so your, your viewers know what this story is about mm. this is a story that um, that's uh, came up from a series of, of FOI requests. Freedom and, of information. Uh, freedom request, of information yeah. requests. Um, and it's, it's revealed that a, a number of police forces have, um, when sending uh, cases for prosecution to the Crown Prosecution Service, um, have classed pe certain people accused of rape who identify as women as women rather than men. So um, they're men, but they, they say they're women. <laughs> they are, but to in, them, they are women. But right. in law, a woman can't rape someone. In law, someone with a penis yes. can rape someone. Yes. So the definition. Uh, well, of, that's of not rape. a woman, by the way. Well, the definition of rape. <laughs> is, that's the barrister talk. Pen penetrate, uh, <laughs> penetration by a penis. It's very early on this. Right. So, and this is this is what astonishes me about the framing of this story yeah. is that it's entirely unhelpful in terms of prosecuting rape. As a prosecutor, what I'm thinking of is, can I? Make, make out the elements of the offence. So in this case, can I prove that a penis penetrated mm. someone and there wasn't consent? I don't actually care whatever culture war point is being being made about the, the owner of the penis, so mm. to speak. What I care about is can I prove the elements of the offence? And sort of getting in getting into this is just it, it's actually going to going to make it much more difficult for prosecutors mm. if you're if we're having arguments about whatever the, the, the latest thing the Home Secretary has decided is, uh, is her culture war priority, if, it, if we're having arguments about that instead of the real thing... But isn't she on the same side as you? She's saying she, she's, she doesn't want this gender ideology war. Well, I'm, I'm saying, no, my, my side, side uh, to, uh, to that is that I, I don't want to be talking about... Um, whether someone is a is a man or a, uh, mm. identifies as a man or a woman when I'm talking about prosecuting mm. rape, I want to be talking about why the the government's um, rapes are just resigned and went back to America because she said that rape myths are rife within the police. Um, I want to, to be talking about why there's not proper care for victims of rape. Well, I think um, I, I think we all want that. Of course we do. And as a woman, of course I want that. But at the same time, neither do I want women gaslit by this situation where men who have raped them suddenly say they are women. Mm. And I actually worry as well about rape statistics going forward because of this. Because we are going to see sexual crimes and we know that 95% of them are carried out by men. That statistic is already changing because those men are declared in that they're women. This is going to change the future in terms of how we look back on crimes and who committed them, where we put people in prison, and how we define And, and so, them. so that then comes to the Isla Bryson case, of course. The Isla Bryson was put into a women's prison until there was such an outcry that Isla Bryson was... There are still men in so, women's well, prisons so you're, so you're not... Uh, you're 
you're not determining you're not determining who's put in prison where uh, based on this. Prison officers have to make an assessment of what makes the uh, the prisoner is going to keep the prisoner safe and what is going to keep other prisoners right. safe, and that's the assessment that determines where the prisoner goes. Mm. And again, we we when you obsess over this sort of. Uh, trans, uh, finding ways to persecute trans people by identifying them with with racists with rapists. Sorry, right. You're distracting from the actual points no, that you um, need, need to be considered. I'm sorry, I'm and just. I'm the, really no. surprised you say that. But yeah. the, and this is the the other other thing that this is this is on the. So you're looking at trans rapists. It gets on the front page of the uh, uh, of the papers. Yeah. Tr your f trans the chances of being sexually assaulted or in any way assaulted okay. by a trans people are statistically infinitesimally small mm. yep. you're much much uh, and by contrast trans people are much more likely to be assaulted to be raped by other okay. other people i'm sorry i need to come uh, in yeah, i really okay, do okay. need to come in here because this actually is an argument that negates all safeguarding because if we are going to say today your chances of your child being raped or abused by somebody are infinitesimally small which they are so let's not have any child safeguarding the chances of you being raped by a trans person are so small let's not have any safeguarding of women actually if you look at the stats and i do know the stats of trans women in prison right now regardless of what prison they're in 52 percent of them are in there for a sexual crime whereas amongst the that's not actually true that is true that's not true that, it was, that true. was a, a taken from a paper where they cut the statistics and so actually the the, the actual uh, quote there is um 52 percent of trans people that are uh, in prison um for a serious offense right. which is the category of offense where you get a certain uh, level of sentence um but if you look at people across the board who are in prison for that sort of crime, then it's going, uh, then it's going to be a very similar situation. Can, can, it's not just similar situation. But, but, sorry, let, let's just think about this in the broader context, because the Home Secretary has been very clear about this. Also, people around the country will read this and think this is outrageous. That's, that will be the mood of the country. I th and I think that's the, that's the idea, right? That's the idea behind that headline, is to make people scared about this highly persecuted minority and as a result we're, we're having this conversation but it is a yeah. minority as well a very, it's a very, 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 very tiny minority. minority. But, but yet, look you at just the, want to be left but, alone. But, but look at the. Look but at you the, know what? I'm a woman. I want to be left alone. But, I don't want men in my space. But, I don't want it, my daughter is, being is told it, she might be a boy. I want to be but, left but alone. But if it is such a small minority, why is it taking over so much of the narrative? And, and Renee's point is right in that this trans ideology does seem to be growing and and uh, affecting many people in all parts of life. Mm. Well. That's a really good point, because if you look at, at why it's, t it's taken over the narrative, it didn't take over the narrative because trans people were asking to be treated as, as human beings. It took over the narrative in uh, 2018 um, and from 2018 because you had a massive rise from that point in anti-trans stories in the media. And uh, Ipsos tracked this. So you, since uh, since 2018, you've had a media obsession um, with really? um, uh, scaring okay, people about so trans people. In the same way, we've had a media obsession with scaring people okay. about immigrants. Can for, I give you a stat that is true as a doctor that I know is true? 20 years ago, there were 70 children a year referred for trans treatment at the Tavistock. Now it's over three and a half thousand. Some of them as young as three. And, and so Renee's right in in that. And of course, we saw all those figures going up, but also the number of referrals went up exponentially to those clinics. Hilary Cass, uh, the p paediatrician, also said that this is unacceptable to label people so early. So it is in the public consciousness, isn't it? And the fact is, what I'm deeply nervous about is people are being labelled incorrectly and the public don't like it. Well, to be honest, I don't think it's anyone's business how you label yourself. Well, it is if it impacts on your life. So, 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 for example, if you life. are biologically a man in a woman's toilet, that impacts on your life as a woman, doesn't it? Um, well, I don't think necessarily Well, how it does. do you know you're not a woman? Well, well that, and that's a fair point. Right. I, I completely take that point. Um, but in, in fact, if you so look at toilets and the... <laughs> It's, it's weird that I know about this, but I, I practice in planning law, so I know about the design of toilets. Right. <laughs> the, um, the design of toilets is, is 
uh, most people are, are switching towards uh, single cubicles now. Uh -huh. So you have a cubicle, it's got toilet and it's got a sink. And you just go into the cubicle. It doesn't matter what's in your pants. You go into the cubicle, you do your business, you come out. Um, in the same way, it's, we've, you know, we had a, a scare story about... Um, Don't you think that women need a, a single sex space so that when... I'm not talking about actually using the cubicle. I'm talking about actually being outside, having a safe space. Don't you think that's important? Yeah, I think it's really important. And I think, and that is... That's where uh, I think probably my qualification is, is getting a bit dodgy. Um, Do you know actually. why women have safe spaces? Yeah. And I can tell you where it came from. It came from when women were moved into factories in the Industrial Revolution. And the factories were only designed for men. There were no female toilets. Women were attacked so often when they went to the toilet that they didn't go to the toilet but, anymore. But, but, or they went in groups. So in the end, people looked at it and thought, actually, we need a safe space for sure, women. Sure, sure. But I'm just, try I'm just trying to defuse this slightly. But also, men, I think, need a safe space. I, 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 think, yes. I think that actually having those biological sex places mm. is important actually i think and for me it's much more context dependent and uh, i look i i'm a, a cis straight white man well, you're not pretty, pretty well off um, you're a man. Well, i think it exists and you're a man. um uh, and so i'm i'm incredibly so, privileged so i don't a, really on, feel so unsafe a cis man is because you are phenotypically a man you look like a man you're genetically man so yep. therefore you're a cis man isn't that a man it's a man oh it's, it distinguishes someone from a trans man. I'm quite happy to say if someone says they're a man, they're a man. If someone says yeah. they're a woman, uh, they're a woman. And in the same way... Do you believe they are? Do you believe a, a man who says he's a woman is actually a woman? Do you know what I believe more powerful than, powerfully than, than anything to do with that is it's none of my business. Oh, it is, though. Have you got it, children? Uh, uh, I have. No, I don't. Right. Well, I do. And it is your business. And when you have children, you might feel differently. Well, if I, if I had children, what I would hope is that I would encourage my children to explore their own identity. And I would support my children in whatever Indeed. identity they, I, I think th they, they found they discovered. I, I, let's draw, draw a line under this because, I mean, it's pretty fruity and, and interesting, actually. But, but at the same time, I totally understand that we need to protect the rights of everyone and that how you define yourself is up to you. But I also take on board Renee's points, which is... We also need to protect people in society as well. And it, it certainly don't need to sway figures, and that's what this is so doing. It, it, it's, it's fascinating. Of course, we also know that this is electoral red meat as well. I wonder why it's on the front page of the Telegraph as well. Well, that's why it's on the front page, right? Because it's electoral red meat. Yeah. OK.